Um, I'm very happy to talk to you today a little bit about how we might be um, innovative and embrace innovation in the land care sector. It's something that I think the land care sector really does very well and something that Wobsey is, is being set up to try and help promote and do, do even better. So we've all been talking today about all the wonderful things that we do to improve the WA environment. It's worth reflecting on why we do this. You know, the Western Australia is special. The South West is the only Australian uh, international biodiversity hotspot. We have more than half of the nation's biodiversity hotspots. These are really special places and places that we all work really hard to protect. Uh, it came up this morning, I think, in the question as well, that West Australians often, was something that was quite new to me, was is a place of new species discovery. And it's still happening. This isn't something that you know, was all, all done and is only located in Brazil. We have one of the highest rates of new species discovery in the world. And this is, so some examples there. Um, obviously the Kimberley is a, a place that new species come on all the time. But when we talk to the WA Museum about invertebrate um, surveys, they talk about the south coast being their place that they really want to understand better. There's new species being discovered all the time. And I like the little picture, of course Mick Davis will talk about it, about how the community is involved in this. The albino trapdoor spider that's on the bottom right there was found in the Grass Valley, handed in at the pub, made its way to Mick Davis, made, it, made its way to WA Museum, and then somehow was globally recognised as some, uh, well, one as a new species, but also as a, as a, a weird and wonderful species and, and, and um, had worldwide, worldwide fame. So we all have a role in identifying and finding these new species. And of course, we need innovation to manage it. So we are still discovering species. We are still understanding how these ecosystems function. And at the same time, we are managing them. We're developing them and we're working in them. So this is definitely a learning by doing. We talked about adaptive management earlier. That is something we have to embrace. So how do we actually involve innovation to ensure that we can have sustainable development and biodiversity conservation? One of the challenges and why, one of the reasons why the WA Biodiversity Science Institute was set up was Australia is an amazing source of new knowledge internationally. If you look at the statistics that were produced in the National Innovation and Science Agenda Report a couple of years ago, we are, I think, in the top, at least the top eight out of the 30 OECD countries in terms of knowledge generations. We publish a lot, we have world leading experts, it is brilliant work. What we do really badly is collaborate with industry and government and people who are actually going to use the information. So how do we actually better integrate across science, policy, managers to ensure that the research that's being done is answering the questions that we actually want answered and how do we make sure that the research is actually influencing how we, how we do business, how do we actually manage our landscape. Here's a couple of models. Uh, this one on the your left was published in a, a recent nature paper, which I always find wonderful when we see these nature papers and you go, oh, that's a deux moment sort of thing. Okay, we have three, <laughs> four models of research and policy relations. And if you swap policy for, for management as well, it probably works in the same way. But one is that researchers come out and tell us what to do. It's a, it's a one-way process. Research drives policy. The other one is that politics drives research. And we see that through funding initiatives and, and the like, where they actually control the way in which research is undertaken through a political agenda. The third model, and the model that we're really working on uh, developing, is this thing called uh, co-actionable science, or the co-development of science. And it's about, and you'll see it links as well with a lot of the adaptive management models, this, this idea that we're actually working in a fully collaborative model on science uh, development at the same time. And the fourth model, is one where we actually have science and management and policy operating completely independently. They are completely separate systems and they should be left to their own devices to actually do their own thing. But we've got a, actually a really good porous membrane through which those, the, the information is, is translated. As I said, I like the third model. And it sort of ties in again with the, the figure that's on the other side, which was published in the National Innovation and Science Report, which is about this idea that we're actually building innovation networks. And when we think about that, we need to see ourselves as part of that innovation network. I have no doubt that there are people here that have new knowledge that we need to embrace in science, that can influence the, the direction of, of work that we do, that can take the work 
and actually see better outcomes um, from, from that science or innovation spectrum. So let's see ourselves as all members of an innovation uh, spectrum. And the other thing that they've got in there is this idea that we're seeing outputs and outcomes. It's, a, it's about real change. And that's through knowledge creation, knowledge transfer, and knowledge application. <laughs> so what is WABSI or WASABI? It's the Western Australian Biodiversity Science Institute. Um, we have been talked about for a long time, but really only formed a couple of years ago. Um, we are an unincorporated joint venture. We are a partnership, a collaborative mechanism between the four Western Australian universities, but, uh, except for Notre Dame, mustn't be that Notre Dame, uh, the CSIRO, and a number of Western Australian government departments, including Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, um, as well as Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions, um, the, the EPA, or Department of Water and Environmental Regulation as well, and Department of Mines and uh, Industry Regulation. So as that collaborative vehicle, what we're trying to do, and reflecting on the Minister's remarks this morning, we're trying to break down some of the silos that we see hot happening between government and our <coughs> science sector, and between that science, the research sector, the government sector, and end users. People are actually using information. So a lot of our work is about getting out there and brokering relationships, developing programs of work that are actually going to address the challenges that we all feel are really important. Under the banner of saying we're improving biodiversity conservation whilst facilitating sustainable development. There is a balance there. So what we do is we link parties together. We actually are an interface, so we're an easy pathway to research capacity. One of the reasons I find that um, we, we don't have as much research and uh, end user collaboration as we'd like to see is often these things, places are really hard to, to find. People are hard to find within these, these systems. So use us as a brokering organisation. Uh, we work with managers and regulators to, to come back to the state and to these research agencies and say, well, look, actually the mining industry is saying these are our major knowledge gaps. The agricultural industry, the land care sector is saying these are our major knowledge gaps we want you working on. So we are a formal mechanism to take that information through and direct research. We don't do the research ourselves. We are just the broker. We've got the strength of all our partners sitting behind us. Um, and that work will be undertaken through partners or with collaborative mechanisms wherever the best capacity system that might be within or without from outside of the state. We focus on partnerships to address key issues for the state. Some of the key priorities we're working on um, that you, um, are, are of relevance um, to you uh, are up there. Some of them like ag land restoration I'll talk a bit more about um, and technologies. Urban forests, I spent the last six months in this very room working on getting science to better inform the rehabilitation planning for row eight, one of the state's most important um, and topical issues in the last election. And now there is a very well-developed rehabilitation management plan that's had community, government, local government and the science partners through WABSI informing its <coughs> development. One of the biggest initiatives that we worked on for the first 12 months and one of the reasons why WABSI was formed is data. You know, we know that there's a lot of survey work happening out there and it's very hard to find <coughs> information. So the first thing that we did was set about, there's an environmental impact assessment process as part of any environmental impact assessment process. People have to do surveys. Usually that surveys data would just be in the background of a PDF report or hidden. We now, uh, delivered through the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, they have set up a system now where all flora and fauna surveys that are part of an environmental impact assessment are registered and accessible through a thing called the Index of Biodiversity Survey for Assessment. So if you're looking for data, there's about 30 surveys a year um, going into that, uh, per month going into that, so it's going to grow very rapidly. Okay, the next step in the biodiversity data is we want to do something useful with it. So that data is coming in largely un unmanaged. So we need to go through processes of actually culture change. We want to have voluntary contribution of data and the land care sector can contribute to that. But also looking at historical data. We're working with the mining companies at the moment to go back through the historical data and seeing if they will actually contribute it. Um, working on the, the data systems and curating the data so the data is a lot more useful. And we're actually working on some of the analysis and modelling tools that might be shared and provide information that we, so part of the conversation is what sort of, in, what sort of decisions would we like this system contributing to? 
obviously working across all those groups, there is a massive number of people undertaking flora and fauna surveys across Western Australia. We want to work with all industry, government, community groups to capture that information and make it accessible. The other aspect of this, which we've heard about a bit today, is all the new technology that's evolving, which allows us to capture and find new information about our plants and animals. Molecular and genomic te techniques. Who's, who's heard, of, heard of the MicroBlitz project? Beautiful. Yep. What a wonderful example of citizen science and yeah, molecular and genomics techniques combining so that people are actually collecting soil samples, sending them into UWA, they're getting that advanced analysis and contributing to a, a Western Australia state atlas. We heard about the uh, Geoscience Australia data cube this morning, making uh, remote sensing data a lot more accessible and useful in decision making. Automated detection tools, things like the camera traps. Camera traps have just taken off incredibly over the last few years. And we're seeing citizen science um, being able to use that camera trap information. We're seeing parks and wildlife actually put their camera trap footage out and I've had my 10-year-old you know, daughter sitting there and helping to go through the footage to identify and, and, and pull out that information. What a wonderful way of, of uh, integrating these new tools. And of course, mobile, new mobile apps and um, electronic identification tools. We're working on a Western Australia eFlora system that's going to help it, uh, make it a lot easier to, to identify um, and standardise our, our, our flora assessment so that the data, quality data, is coming in. The thing I wanted to talk about, which is probably, yeah, is the, tied a lot to the program work that I'm doing, is about landscape restoration. Um, I've, I've um, been working, I guess, with a, a few in the room here about trying to set state scale targets for what we're actually trying to drive in the landscape restoration, where we need innovation. Some of the numbers that have been thrown about is this idea that we've had more than $7 billion invested through the land care sector with lots of wonderful, you know, good news stories in there in terms of species recovery, uh, in terms of, yeah, the, the, we heard about nursery development, seed and supply uh, plant supply chains being developed out there, wonderful land care practitioner networks. This network, the land care network, has now been adopted largely as, an, as the new agri you know, agricultural innovation network through things called grower groups in Western Australia. And we're seeing that the land care is actually a really great model for driving innovation. And we estimate, uh, Richard Harper estimated in his, his paper that we've had about 100,000 hectares, which is no small feat of revegetation. And that covers both environmental plantings and some of the agroforestry type plantings. But are we seeing the change we want to see? The, on the left here is some figures from the Wheatbelt NRM dashboard, which, you know, they, they talk to um, people doing revegetation work and, and nursery owners each year to get an estimate on, on what level of reveg is happening. So last year there was about 2,000 hectares planted, that's pretty good. But at the same time, there was about 1,300 work hectares of clearing permits mm -hmm. in that region. So what is our net balance? We actually, it's another thing we're working on with the state, is actually a, a better, we need a vegetation change in condition tracking system for the state. Um, so we are all working really hard. Can we use innovation to come up with some solutions that means that that hard work can translate into better outcomes in the future. So what are some of the big questions in, in terms of restoration that we need to, to, to look at? We need to balance this trade-off or the questions around quality and scale. So we need to be able to go from delivering tens to hundreds to thousands of hectares to tens of thousands to millions potentially of, of hectares of change. When we've talked, uh, we had a workshop in the last year we tried to set some goal setting. We said, say, 10% of the agricultural region. Well, that's about 10 million hectares. Is that, I mean, it's probably a 50-year target, 100-year target. Let's look at that. But what sort of scale change? In the Pilbara region, when I'm looking at the mining, it's a little bit different. But at the current rates of seed collection, it'll take about 1,000 years to collect the seed that's required for the restoration, rehabilitation obligations. So <laughs> there's some work. <laughs> we, you know, the scale of these challenges are large. They're not, we, we mustn't be overwhelmed by them, but we actually need innovation to ensure that our business systems, our technology can actually deliver the, at that scale. So the other side thing is that we're actually starting to finally think about the outcomes that we want from rehabilitation restoration programs. Nick's talk this morning was 
brilliant in terms of actually understanding the different types of restoration works and the types of biodiversity outcomes that are associated with those. On the right hand side, um, the, so the National Ecological Restoration Standards were published a couple of years ago. It's a leading innovative um, collaboration between research and practitioners. And the international standards were also published after that, following the Australian ones. Includes this idea that we actually have one to five star recovery, but also we have restorative actions. And we need more work on the social, cultural and economic barriers or opportunities that are allow, going to allow us to meet the scale and quality out, outcomes that we're looking for. So last couple of slides, just talking about this concept of the, uh, a platform for ecological restoration research. Um, what is it? We're working across Australia with, with a number of groups, including the CSIRO, the CSIRO and DBCA here, and Murdoch University, to develop a suite of embedded short and long-term experiments, an active network of practitioners and researchers. This idea that our um, land care sites can become experimental sites and formally recognised as part of regional, national and international experiments. A digital platform that supports data access and collaboration and a mechanism to support adaptive management and track real change. Um, I've skipped over the big question, um, ecological question. This is actually probably the most important thing that I think we need to do and some, a process I'm going to start working on over the next six to 12 months is actually what are the key questions that we would like to see answered through a framework like this. Both working with the research ex uh, community and with the practitioner community. So what does an experimental planting actually look like? Well, it actually sounds really good, but it's quite simplistic. Probably one of the questions that we get asked all the time is how do, how do we choose our, our genetic provenancing, seed selection, to make sure we have climate resilient plantings? Well, you, we can be, build experiments in. We don't necessarily have a full answer to that yet. But we can build experiments into the planting that we're doing so that we have a trial and error approach, but we have robust science uh, sitting alongside that. This is an example of CSIRO and Greening Australia working on a climate provenancing trial. So where do we go from here? Well, let's really start thinking, and I'm keen to work with you guys on how we actually build an innovative innovation network across our land care and research community through experimental planting. So this concept, um, we've got, we had a discussion paper that we submitted to the federal government uh, in the middle there, which is about this concept of a national ecological restoration research infrastructure. We're at the moment working on some guidelines for experimental plantings. And if anyone, in fact, the, you know, the Warren Catchment Council presentation on Blackwood um, and uh, the, the blackberry removal and the revegetation work is a really good example of CSIRO, DBCA, Warren Catchment Council working together uh, through an adaptive management mechanism. I'm looking for case studies. So let me know if you've got a really good example of when you've worked uh, well or you've found a good experience of working with the research sector to advance your, your learning. But how do we go forward? Well, let's look at developing this network of experimental plantings that are actually going to answer some of the questions that we've got. And thank you for the time. I think it's time for a drink. <laughs> <laughs>